Now, Pastor, um, I want to get a little uh, into what it is that you think the church needs to do to impact the community and kind of, I guess, improve public relations between the church and the community. A lot of people perceive that uh, the church is full of stuck up people who uh, are uh, judgmental, um, and I haven't found that to always be the experience. Right. Um, so help us understand what, as people that go to church or people who are not in the church, how we can just improve the relationship so that those who want to come to church can come and those who are in the church can be more accepted. Well, you know, that's a very good question, very good question, and I, I deal with it all the time. And I'll speak from myself as a pastor, and then, of course, uh, as lay members. Uh, as a pastor, I find myself uh, in the community because, you know, a lot of times, you know, we they, people say and believe that pastors uh, show up on Sunday mornings and we don't see them for the rest of the week. Uh, I, I'm one of those pastors who like to be out and about. Uh, you know, I like to be in the mall, even though I may not be buying that not just in, in the mall. I uh, like to go out to eat, you know, I mean, want to meet and touch people. Uh, we live in a day and time now, Gary, where, you know, when you find pastors, we had five and six armor bearers. That season is over. We're living now in the time, and this is the truth. We're living in time now that the people have to smell like the shepherd. In other words, he has to be amongst the people. In order to really lead the people, you have to be amongst the people. And what I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, intertwining, but still leading at a distance. But what we have to do is really show the community that the church is not just here as a building, as a lot of people just coming to gather. But we're coming here to gather information and to learn things to take out back into the community. That's what I tell people, we don't live in these four walls. We don't live here. We live outside of there. And so we learn here how to function out there. But we've got to let people know that we're not hypocrites. We, have, we make mistakes just like everybody else. And that's what a lot of church churches don't do. We don't make people feel like it's okay. And, you know, we do mess up. We do make mistakes. Because even myself as a pastor, I still make mistakes. Sometimes I may not always say the right thing. But and that's what we have to teach people out in the community that makes them say, wow, so they are real people. And that's the thing that I, I think is going to really help affect our, you know, uh, affect our community in a positive way when people who are per se still in the world realize that we don't have it all together. All of us, I tell people right now, the church is not a museum for saints. The church is a place for sinners. It's a hospital for sinners. This is where we all come to get our healing. All of us come to get our help. And that's the way the church has to impact the community. You know, you touched on something, and you said that we all have uh, problems. We all yes. have issues. Um, why is it that you believe that when we get into church that we get this kind of uh, self-righteous attitude, like we got it all together, knowing that when we go home, we got the same problems that we walk into church with, right. but we want to give an appearance mm -hmm. that everything is together. How do you help that person that's in church that, you know, kind of tipping that line of trying to paint the picture of perfection to just be real. That's, a, that's, that's a good question. I can tell you, and I say it every Sunday at our church here at Beacon Light. Um, your greatest deliverance is when you get delivered from people. See, a lot of people are not delivered from people because we're so concerned about what people are going to think or say about us. And that's why we have to put on the front. That's why we have to feel like we have to put on the airs because we, we're in church. And I don't want nobody to, to see me crying. I don't want nobody to see me uh, going to the altar because they're going to wonder why I'm going up there, why I have to repent. Your greatest deliverance is when you get delivered from people. Because I always tell people, you don't have to, you don't have to prove anything to nobody. The only person I'm really living for is for God. And here's, here's a song that we sing. And the song says, he sees the depths of my heart. And he still loves me the same. That's why I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed that I love God. I don't put on no airs at church. Who you see me or the way you see me at church is the way I am at my house. The way I am at my house is the way I am in the mall. Because I've been delivered from people. And I tell anybody, your greatest deliverance is when you get delivered from people. Now, you touched on, you, you, you jump it all into the yeah. stuff that, that really, <laughs> really relates. Um, a lot of young people in ministry, yeah. Um, are at war with themselves mm -hmm. uh, because they want to be cool, yeah. but they also want to uh, be holy in the yeah. perception of uh, ministers and pastors. Right. They want to seem like they got 
you know, everything together. Wow. Say something to the young preachers, the young people in ministry, uh, just to help them stay true to themselves, but stay true to God at the same time. Well, you know, the, the thing with young preachers and, 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 and young people is that sometimes you, you really have to have patience. That, that's one of the things that we're missing in ministry. Uh, you know, I heard, I, heard, I heard a pastor say this, and this is so true. Uh, when you look at another pastor who we deem to be successful and got it going on, you know, we, we look at, he got a nice car, he wears nice clothes, and even his wife, you know, she got on Gucci. And man, I'm telling you, they, they, you know, they got swag and right, all of that right. good stuff. And so we see all those things, and, and I tell people all the time, you see their glory, but you don't know their story, right? You don't know what, what it took to get where they are. You know, a lot of times, and, and, and here's the thing, Gary, when we don't see it a lot of times in, in ministry now, we don't see servanthood. Right. right. We don't see servanthood. Let, let me say this to you, that David's first trip to the palace was not through the front door. David's first trip to the palace was through the servants' quarters. And that's what we've gotten away from. Nobody wants to serve. Everybody wants to be on top. But the question is, there's only sometime in the church, like it is today, there's only one pastor. The question is, can you be anointed to be a servant? Wow. Can you be anointed? What if God never calls you to pastor? Can you be anointed to be the second man in charge? Or the third man? Faithfully too. Faithfully. Can you do it? But that's why I'll say to young pastors and young men, young women in ministry, just be patient. God knows exactly where you are. When it's your time, when it's your time to shine, God knows how to come get you. Remember Moses. Moses was on the backside of the desert. God knew exactly where he was. When it was his time to go to the children of Israel, to go to Pharaoh, and say, Pharaoh, God says to let my people go. God knew exactly where he was. Now you said that um, the, the, the glitz and glamour part of ministry, mm -hmm. a lot of people have issue with pastors uh, being successful. Mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, probably right, that right, is. Right. Uh, I look at it from this perspective. A pastor's kind of like a CEO of a company. Mm -hmm. A company has investors. Right. And if those investors are doing well, then the, the CEO does well. Exactly. Now, why, now I know some people do get uh, outlandish with it, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, you know, it's a bit excessive in right. some avenues. Right. Uh, but help people understand that, you know, what it is that really happens behind the scenes mm -hmm. with a pastor. Because a lot of people don't understand, you know, they had pastors that hurt them, or they had pastors that used them, and they just see pastors riding in nice cars, and they right. see them having nice things, but they don't understand. So tell us a little bit of your story mm -hmm. and, and how it, it fits into the broader scope yeah. of what men and women in the faith go through. Well, you know, it's, 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 very, it's very deep. And I'll, and I'll say this, you know, even myself, uh, I've, uh, when I first began to pastor, uh, most people for myself, I worked a secular job. I, I worked in corporate America. Uh, I took a pay cut, a major pay cut, to come pastor a church. Wow. I took a major pay cut. See, I believe that sometimes you have to sacrifice for God. See, those are the type of things that sometimes I don't think pastors uh, tell people. That, that, you know, there were times when me and my wife, I was just sharing this with a pastor earlier today, that I was sharing with a pastor that I remember when me and my, my wife and I had to go to the local Shell gas station with $3 worth of quarters and dimes and say, give me $3 on number five. And also we've had our struggles. We've had our struggles, you know, with, with, uh, with the lights being turned off. People want to re re repossess the car. And then, of course, as we begin to grow, uh, I got a better job, started making more money, and things began to change for me. But that was, that was even in the secular world. But even when I became a pastor, I took a pay cut. And this is what most people are saying. See, we see what's on the surface, but we don't understand the struggles that goes behind the scene. Because a lot of times, you may see a nice car, but you don't realize that that nice car is, is maybe an image for somebody. And I think sometimes we, we've been, you know, because of our older pastors, made it feel like we have to have an image. But I tell people, clothes don't make the man. The man, man make the clothes. clothes. Right. You know, I, I mean, I, and I really speak for myself. I drive a nice car, it's a maximum. And I like it, man. <laughs> but I don't, the car don't make me. Right. I make the car, it's tricked out though. Right. Right. It's right. tricked right. out. <laughs> it's tricked out. But, but I like it. And so my thing is, 
I, I say this, Gary, when we talk about, because I know one of the things is people get caught up in the money and stuff. But here's the thing, Jay. Gary, I believe a pastor should be blessed financially. I, I really believe. Let me tell you why. Because you can have a guy bounce a basketball up and down the court, and he ain't changing nobody's life. But he can get paid millions of dollars to dribble a basketball and put it in the hoop, and nobody has a problem with it. But let a man of God who is helping change a person's life forever. That man now is a better husband. He's a better father. That, that woman is a better, a better mother, a better wife. Those children are now growing up in a, in a Christian home. And that's not a price you can put on that. But let a pastor buy a new suit. Let, let him get a new car. Oh, he, he won't. No, he's helping change somebody's life. And you cannot put a price on it. I wonder, I often wonder, if your pastor came and he had holes in his jeans or yeah. his, his shoes were talking to him when, right. when he walked in the room, he got a beat up car. Right. How many people would really be there? You know, because it doesn't it doesn't yeah. exude success. Right. It doesn't say success. And when you look at a basketball player, whoever their favorite player is, it's right. somebody who's successful. Yeah, you, you know, the highest paid players mm -hmm. are the most successful players. Right. And so if a pastor's producing Shouldn't he be a conversation? I tell you what, Gary, it's like this is, you know, I, I believe so. You know, I tell people all the time, if the church grow, just, just let the pastor grow with the church. You know, don't just keep him and treat him in a kind of way. He's doing what God has called him to do. And, you know, first of all, the Bible says that the, a man is, is worthy of his hire. That's what the Bible says. That, that you know, you don't, you don't muzzle the ox. If a pastor is sharing, and this is not no rags to riches, this is not no prosperity message, this is just about what God is able to provide and meet your needs. So if I'm a pastor and saying that God is able to do this, and God can do this, and God can open doors, and God can make ways, if I'm saying that, then some of those things have to be demonstrated in my life. So the people who are, who are, who are part of this church and part of this ministry, when they see it in my life, they say, if God can do it for him, he can do the same thing for me. So I'm going to shift gears. And I think you really, really hammered in those points because it's, it's a lot that uh, people just miss along right. the way, not understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, they just don't have a, a clear understanding of right. what it is that goes on behind the scenes in ministry and the, the burden and the struggle yeah. of ministry. Um, I know for firsthand that uh, you don't call that basketball player or you don't call that designer when your mama passes away right. or somebody goes to jail yeah. and you call the pastor. There you go. Your pastor comes there for you. Yeah. And I've seen you multiple times throughout the city. And you know, right. uh, I, I, I notice, I kind of sit back and I watch pastors and I see mm -hmm. what they're doing and I can tell what type of person you are just right. from seeing you. Um, and I know a lot of people affiliated with the church. Right. So I just want to know, what does Beacon Life have planned for 2013? Where do you see Beacon light in the next twelve months. Oh wow, man, it's amazing. Uh, you know, God, God gives the gives you vision. But I'll say this: you know, a lot of times when God gives it to us, He doesn't give us all the details. But one thing I do realize, and I shared this uh, with Beacon Light in the year 2013, Gary, I believe first of all that Beacon Light, what God has for us, it's gonna be bananas. <laughs> man, it, it's gonna be crazy. And I've been saying that this year we are walking in the fog. We are walking in the fall. We are walking in the favor of God. And this is what we said all year long. So Gary, I believe what God is going to continue to do is to add to us, not just numerically, but God is going to add to us spiritually. I believe that Beacon Light is going deeper. It's going deeper from a spiritual aspect, not just from a numerical aspect, but God is growing us up in the things of God. And I can't wait to see what the end is going to be like. Wow. Well, Pastor, we ask a signature question with the Rouge Collection. Yeah. Uh, we ask every time, if you could make one statement to every single person in the world, what would it be and why? Uh, I, I would, this, the one statement that I, I would make, and, and it's because this is what I believe I have lived my life, my life about. I, 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 the one statement I would, would make is, love people regardless. Because when people don't deserve love, that's when you have to love them. It's when they don't deserve it. The Bible says God is love. And wherever you find God, you're going to find love. 
And that's what, you know, that's what I live for. I, I love people. And I believe God allowed me to pastor because he knew my passion and my love for people. And I'll tell anybody, love people. And I know sometimes you say, really, people are hard to love. Yes, but guess what? You and I sometimes are hard to love. Right. So at all times, love people because God loves us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a wonderful time here with Pastor Eric Williams yes. at Seek and Light. Pastor, we want to thank you for allowing thank us to you. sit yeah, down and really interview with you. I really appreciate Thank you and so we, much. We want to sit down with you again, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.